We've been looking for several weeks, or this is the third, um, at a scripture, a prophecy um, in the book of Isaiah, written 700 years before the time of Jesus, nearly 2,700 years ago from today. And in this prophecy, God has given Isaiah this message to share with the nation of Israel, God's chosen and loved people. We remember that Abraham uh, and then Isaac and then uh, the lineage continued uh, of the ones who were called by God and chosen to be his, his prized possession and his nation on the earth to spread his love and salvation and justice and mercy and truth. And so in this, this prophecy, we see that the coming king is also a coming baby. If you'd ring along with me, God says to Isaiah, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. See, at this time in the nation of Israel, what they really longed for was a king who was going to come. And, and the prophecies have said that he was going to come and be God. But for them, they wanted one who was going to, to rule from the top. It, it was going to be a top-down type of hierarchy where the king's at the top and he gives his orders and it goes down uh, the the rungs and down the ladders and and then the nation is able to do the work of God but God had other plans and he sent a a baby his name was Jesus and so through this series we've been looking at this at this child and at this kingdom and at this um, as as the gospels would say in in the gospel of Matthew the kingdom of heaven We've been looking at, at, at this kingdom, and um, in the first uh, two weeks, we looked at, at, at the phrase, wonderful counselor, and then mighty God, and today we're going to consider everlasting father. But we're not going to really consider it from a top-down approach, but more from a, an undergirding, and through the eyes of love. So, um, I don't know about you, but I've had quite a few experiences with love, and uh, they could go either way. I mean, I use the, the, the term love for many different things. I use it for sports, for sports teams, um, to, to describe my relationship uh, with other people, to describe my relationship uh, with my pet dogs. Um, I, I use the word love to describe many things. And as we look at the word love used within the context of today, here are, are three truths that we see. And if you want to take uh, notes, you can take these notes about earthly love. Most often, earthly love is conditional. Most often, earthly love is selfish. Most often, earthly love is temporary. Most often, it's conditional, selfish, and temporary. And I don't know how, what your experience has been, but generally, that's how love goes. There was a time in my life when I would have said that I really love, like, crayons and coloring and nap time. And, well, maybe I still love nap time. But the crayons and the coloring, that was conditional on me being a child, and then there are times when I say, I love running, and I love racing. But then there's the time when I get into the race, and there's a mile to go of a 10-mile race. And I don't know if you've ever run before, but at that point, love is not the word that's coming out of your mouth. It's more like, I hate this thing. I loathe it. I love my wife. But here's, here's something that, that I came to terms with a few years ago. I started thinking about this relationship I have with my wife. And I, and I usually say it's unconditional. And you guys that are married or in a relationship, you'll say, this is an unconditional relationship. And I do believe that it's one, of the, it's one of the most blessed and most cherished relationships. But at its foundation, that relationship is still built on conditions. We all know of, of men and women whose, whose love has broken. And given the chance, yes, I'd lay down my, my life for my wife. But one of the reasons I love her is because she loves me. Today I want us to explore, and we're, we're going to explore this, this, this thing called love. And I want us to try to put aside, if we can, our, our, our connotations and our experiences with love. And let's try to look at, at what the Bible says about the love that has been shown to us through Jesus Christ. Because it is a great love. And I, I think that, that our, it's, our relationship with God... And the fruit of our relationship with God is dependent on our understanding of this, of this, simple, this simple word. So we're going to jump in. We're going to take a few notes, and then we're going to talk about elves. Is that okay with y'all? Okay. 
Um, the first note, uh, the gift of Jesus' love, um, the, the first one is that our everlasting fathers, uh, he loves us no matter what. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul tells us, he says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still, and help me with this word, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, we would call this unconditional love, that Jesus, who God sent, um, God in, in human form, Jesus never sinned. This is one of the doctrines that we believe about him. So that when he went to the cross and he laid his life down for us, it was something that wasn't seen as just. In, in, in Paul's day, and it should be the same thing in our day, if there's a person who, who is, uh, let's say, that is held at gunpoint, the natural thing that would happen if there were two people and one was just an extremely evil person, the other one was a good person, most of the time the one who, in our eyes, if we're just saying what, what dr- justice would be, um, it would be for the person who's been extremely wicked and extremely evil to be the one that has has to go okay i know this is really weird like chainsaw massacre ish in the sermon and i'm sorry but i'm just trying to prove a point okay in, in in their day and as we look throughout the scriptures the love that god has shown through us through jesus christ is counterintuitive to the nature um, of love it, it is absolutely yes unconditional but is it are there conditions let's read once again what he says about us in this deal You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for who? Us, who are the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. So in other words, the the, the person who is extremely evil, um, if they come to a moment at the end of their life where they're like, okay, justice has to be served, they will jump in front um, and and take the bullet for the the good person. Um, uh, Verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still who? Sinners, Christ died for us. So it's not as simple, um, I I don't think, as God just having unconditional love for us. And maybe this is, uh, while Pastor Jason and I, as we were talking through this, he said, you know, maybe the best description here is is to say our everlasting Father loves us no matter what. But the truth is, uh, one of the reasons that God loves us is because we can't save ourselves. Because we are his prized possession. The Bible says that we were created in the image of God. That, that he is jealous for our worship to him. And so the conditions of us um, earning his love, there, there may be conditions. And I hope that you're okay with that. Um, you, you do. There are conditions on, on you being loved by God. And here, here's, here's your conditions. You've got to be a person. Check, we got that one. Um, uh, you have to... to uh, to be a sinner? Anybody? <laughs> Got any sinners in the house this morning? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. And you have to be powerless. Like, how, how many of you guys at the end of the day, like, you don't have much power? Like, no, no matter how, how, you know, how much you try to be like Charles Xavier, you can't, like, read anybody's mind. Like, you just, you just can't do it. Anybody? At, yeah, at the end of the day, there's conditions, but it's, it's just counterintuitive. No matter what, God loves us. We can't earn God's love. Um, Jesus says, come To me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. How many of you, how many of you would find it good news that your your love from God isn't dependent upon how often you read the Bible or how eloquent your prayers are or your church attendance? Like we'd love for you to, you know, be here every Sunday, but but how how many of you is it is it a relief that like like last week You miss church, and then you just had some bad things happen during the week, and you're thinking, you know what? God's just punishing me. How how many of you? How many does it feel good right now to know that, like God, just He He really does love you, because you're bad. I mean, that's a good thing. That's good news to me. I love reading about this. Um, How how many of you would would be relieved to stop looking over your shoulder, waiting for God to punish you every time that you you have a misstep? God's love for us. We're going to get to this in a, in a few minutes a little more deeply. God's love for us is not dependent on our goodness. It's dependent upon his grace and mercy. And that's good news. Secondly, uh, if you're taking notes, our everlasting father loves us just because. Um, we have in, in the book of Acts chapter 17, we have this account where Paul, 
is, is doing his little his missionary journey. He's going around. He's planting churches. He's going around and, and teaching different people. When he sees a person who has questions about God, he goes and answers them. When he sees people that don't want to qu- ask questions about God, he goes and asks the questions and helps them find, about, find out about Jesus. And uh, so he's going into Athens um, to this place called the Areopagus. And, and basically what you need to know about, that's like going to the Supreme Court. That would be like us going into like the, the central hub um, of, of thought and policy making uh, for the United States. It, it would be like, like us going there and going to speak to the high ups um, of, of our nation. And so Paul's going there to this Roman Empire place, and, and on his way in, he's passed by um, all of these different monuments and statues and idols uh, that were, that were uh, what the people worship. And so um, as he goes in and he's observed all this, and he gets ready to speak to all these people, most, you know, almost none of them were Christians, uh, none that we know of, he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, um, I found an, also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Okay, so as he's going in, he sees all these statues. And if you could just for a moment put yourself in that place. We, we, have, uh, we have complete, uh, and, and I know that we feel like, and people post on Facebook and all that stuff, that like, you know, like, our time of religious freedom is coming to an end. I don't know. I'm not speaking about that. But we have great freedom. And none of us have really experienced um, in our lifetime, um, and I hopefully, hopefully not in your, in your family, um, we've not uh, experienced state-sponsored worship. And basically what that was was for this Roman Empire, for you to be considered a good citizen of the Roman Empire, you were required not only to, to pay your taxes and to just be a good person, you were also required to worship the state gods and goddesses. And so as we think about like Greek mythology and we think of those, those different gods that maybe you, you learned about in literature, literally uh, that, that wasn't just a concept back then, it was something that was that they did with their lives. They spent their, their money. Um, they would take their, their animals and go and sacrifice them. They spent a, a lot of their time going to these different gods and goddesses' statues and, and, and doing the, the offerings, doing the worship in an effort to appease the gods so that they would look favorably uh, upon the Roman Empire. And, and to, to the, the emperor and to all the others there, and even the emperor was worshipped as a god. Um, that's just another side note there. Uh, to them, for you to be a good citizen, you had to worship all these, these gods. And they, they were so uh, particular about this, and they wanted to make sure that all their bases were covered. As Paul's going in, he sees that there's this tomb with the inscription mark, and it's, and, and it's not like Dionysus or like Zeus or anything. It's like, to the unknown god. I mean, if, you know, just so we make sure we get them all. Let's, to the unknown god. And he goes in. And he stands before these people, and he says, I perceive you're religious. And he says, let me tell you about this God that that you don't know. And so he goes on, what you therefore worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. And you have the scripture in your worship, God. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. You see the irony here? Like Paul comes and these people have, have created homes. I don't know if you've ever been to a foreign country and you've actually seen uh, idol worship. But they, they have these like literal uh, small elaborate structures and they have um, a, a little dummy god that they've made, that's been made by hands that are sitting in there. And, and they bring the drinks and, and literally I, I was in Cambodia and they had a, a, a little uh, Hindu god box thing. And they would bring uh, little cups of coffee in the morning. And in Cambodia, the temperature is like 120. I mean, it's like, you know, you could fry egg at like 7 a.m. in the morning on the road. I mean, it's really, really hot. And by the end of the day, no lie, the idol drank all of the coffee through evaporation but still it happened so i mean so they eat and drink. they don't they don't really drink as much on cloudy days um so anyway do you see the irony here these guys are spending all this time trying to build a house for god and he comes paul and he just says you're basically you're wasting your time god doesn't live in these places he's not his love for us and his blessing and at, at at the foundation of this, I think we can say, oh, stupid Romans. But they're trying, to, they're trying to get God's favor. And I think every one of us would say, we want God's favor. Amen? I mean, anybody? Does anybody want God's favor here? I mean, because if you want to curse, you can, I mean, we probably can find you a pagan church or something. I don't know. Um, we want God's favor. And that's what they wanted. But they just didn't know 
who God was. So Paul would go on to say, you don't have this in your scripture, but I thought it was important, so I pulled it out. Um, he, he goes on, Paul tells them of a God who created them and loves them, and then he says uh, of this God, yet he, is, he, yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And then he says to them, for indeed we are his offspring. This was something revolutionary for them, that you were like, that people were created by God. And that God like, would actually want to come and spend time with us here. And, and Paul would go on and tell them about Jesus and about the Spirit and about how God was with them then. But, but for them, their framework and where they, they began, and I think this may be true for many of us, is that God is off somewhere else doing his God thing. And if we're real good, we can get him to come here. Because God, ultimately, is a selfish God. But in reality, he's a selfless God. We'll get to there in a minute. Uh, the, the next note, our everlasting father, this is number three. I'm just going to round this out. Our everlasting father loves us forever. In Romans 8, 37 through 39, listen to Paul. He says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither height nor depth nor neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if I was to tell you to pick five books of the Bible, and for the rest of your life, these are the only books of the Bible that you're allowed to read. Like, for the rest of your life, and you have to, you have to, 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 base your understanding and your theology, your doctrine of who God is in relationship to you and in relationship to the whole thing. If you, if, if you had to pick five books, I hope, and if I had to pick five books, I would pick the book of Romans. It, it, this, this, the book is like the pinnacle of, um, of, of Paul's understanding and theology of the saving work of Jesus. And if you go in and try to do a Bible study on this thing, it's going to wear you down. I promise it will, but it will bring about life because this thing is deep. Um, he, he goes in and he uses words like propitiation, okay? You don't want me to use that this morning. It's a good thing, but it's real. Um, but he, he uses all these huge terms and he goes through and he explains the saving work of Jesus Christ. But as I watch Paul and as I see uh, others like Peter, uh, you see John, uh, you see James, Jesus' brother, um, you see the, the writer. Of, as, you, as you watch all of these writers of the New Testament of the scripture who God divinely inspired to write these words so that we could be instructed as a church today. As you watch every one of them, most of the time they start in a place where they're expressing and expounding upon these deep theological truths of God, but every one of them finally winds up to love. They land at the importance of love, that love binds all things together. You know that, that, that great 1 Corinthians chapter 13 deal? Did anybody have that in their wedding? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, anybody? Does anybody remember their wedding day? I mean, I'm just hoping like you do. Is anybody married? Come on, is there, everybody awake? Do I need to throw an elf at you or something? How many, how many of y'all spied the elf, by the way? Anybody? It's just a few of you, okay. Okay, um, Okay. ADHD, where am I at? Uh, so, God loves you, though. Uh, let me see. Where am I? Let me make sure. Okay, he loves us forever. And if you were to pick a book in the Bible, I hope that you would put, pick Romans and, and as you watch all these guys, they do. They finally land at the importance of love. Because if you don't understand love, then you're not going to have a good foundation on which to understand God. And so, um, going a little further, um, a little further into that, just, just, just listen for a second. Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life Angels nor demons, present or future. Are, are you getting a, a, a grasp on the scape of this? I mean, it's not like just a love, like the word, like the word love on a, on a page. He's, 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 describing, he's describing the dimensions of God's love. That it's not just right now, like it's in the past and it's in the future just as well as it is in the present. That it is extremely, it's extremely high and it's extremely deep. Are, 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 you getting, are you getting a sense and, and a grasp on this? I, I want to ask you, is, is, your, is your heart feeling uh, or, or your understanding in your heart about love, is it that deep? It might have to do with the way you see love. How many of you have an elf on the shelf, by the way? Anybody have an elf on the shelf? So a few years ago, these, um, 
these uh, ladies wrote this book called The Elf on the Shelf. And basically, just so everybody's in the loop, uh, when I was a boy, Santa Claus could be everywhere at one time. And it was amazing. Like, and Santa knew everything I did, um, naughty or nice. And, uh, but nowadays, Santa is sending around uh, elves to go to everybody's house. And so Santa sent us at Ignite Church an elf. And um, he got touched this morning. So one of the rules about the elf is that you're not supposed to touch the elf, okay? Because if you touch the elf, he loses his superpowers. But the elf goes around, and he, and he, and he, he comes. Uh, Santa sends the elf to come to your house. Y'all hanging with me, right? Okay. He sends the elf to come to your house the day after Thanksgiving, and the elf stays until Christmas Eve. And, and every night, the elf flies to the North Pole and tells Santa all of the good things and all of the bad things uh, that the kids have done during the day. But then what happens is when the elf comes back for the morning time, the elf hides in different places so the kids can't find it. And, but the task is, and what a lot of kids do, is they, they run around and find the elf. But here's the thing, you can't touch the elf because then the elf will lose its superpowers and won't be able to fly back to the North Pole. Y'all hanging with me, right? Okay? Okay. So this is a big deal. And like um, Santa's just been sending the elf, so he sent us at Ignite Church an elf. But the, what happened was uh, uh, Stephanie and Danielle touched him so, like, he, he's, he can't fly back to Santa now. Oh, everybody say, oh. Everybody say, hey, Bernie. His name is Bernie because he burns for Jesus. And um, because he's an, he's an old-time igniter. Um, Santa made him a long time ago. But his hands are glued together for some reason, like Gongman style. I don't, under, I don't understand why. But Bernie, um, so here's Bernie. And, um, and I've been thinking about it a lot. And I don't think he's going to stay. I think he's going to, he might stay. That would be, okay. If we lose Bernie, it's okay. He's, he's padded. He's going to be all right. Um, boom. <laughs> I'm convinced, I'm convinced that so many people's understanding and theology of God is like the relationship that many have with the Elf on the Shelf. I mean, think, think about it. He comes, for, first of all, and this is people's understanding, okay? This isn't, this, just, just hang with me, okay? He comes with a book of, of do's and don'ts. See, are you seeing the correlation here? He comes, he comes with a book um, of, you have to, you get to name him um, in the beginning. So, so then you name him. And a lot of people's concept of God, you know, his first name might be Father and his last name might be God, but his middle name is like Boat or Money or success, or fame, or new job, or hot wife, or just a decent husband. I, I, don't, I don't know, or like 20 kids. I don't know. I don't know. But a lot of us have names for God. You hang in with me, right? For, for, for many people, God is, or God is like an elf that only comes around a few times a year, but other parts of the year he's off doing elf things, or God things. But then Bernie comes around, and um, just for a little while, but only to check on us and see if we're naughty or nice. Makes a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's been fully immersed or not. Jesus Christ is coming. Okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Just be honest with yourself. How many of you have had this kind of theology in relationship with God? And, and, and the thing is, when you finally like get your mind wrapped around it and you get real close and, you, and you, you touch it, it actually loses its power. I don't think God loses its power, but I don't think God's an elf on the shelf. Um, you don't have this scripture with you. He's just going to have to hang out there. You don't have this scripture with you, but if you, want, if you have your Bible and want to turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, I want to share with you a little bit of what John who this past year we've looked a lot at John. We went through a series called The Seven when we looked at the seven churches and this message that Jesus came and gave to John to give to uh, the different churches that he was pastoring. Uh, we, we ran through First um, John, did a series called The Letter at the very beginning of the year. And so we've just really been saturating ourselves in, in this guy who was not just a guy, but he was one of the, of the inner circle of the disciples of Jesus Christ. He was an apostle, a church planner, a church father. And at the end, and as we read like letters like First John, Second um, John, and Third John, and in, in, in Revelation, we we look at John and we listen to his words, and we see that yeah, it's important these doctrinal, these theological things, this jargon. But at the center of it, the question is: at the end of the day, 
where is love at in, in the relationship and in the mixture and in your heart? And so he, he begins, or this is just kind of comes in the middle, and he says, he says the word love, like, I think around 70 times in this book. So I don't have the exact figure right here, but I think if I remember from that, that series we did, it's, it's a lot, okay? Um, but this is what he, he, he's kind of wrapping up and tying up this letter. He says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love God uh, does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so he, he, he begins, most people would say, um, that we don't, we don't know love until we know God. But where John seems to be taking us is that God is equal to love. And so if you know anything about like mathematical equations, if something, if A is equal to B, then B is also equal to A. And so if we were to, to, to turn these around, we would have that love is equal to God just as God is equal to love. Y'all hanging with me? It's going, to get, it's going to get a little deep for the next five or six minutes. But then I hope that it gives us something to stand on, okay? Um, let's continue. In verse 9, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son, Jesus, into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Okay, so we have that God is equal to love and love is equal to God. So my question for you, and, and this is just kind of a, you don't have to answer this, but are, 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 you, are you open enough in your faith to believe that wherever love is, that the possibility is that God is there? I, I'm open to that. But what the scripture shows us here is that it's important for us to understand what that equal signs is. Um, it's, it's a sort of a, it's the catalyst of the equation. And the catalyst in the, the equal signs is Jesus, okay? Y'all tracking with me? You tracking with me, okay? We've t- been talking about him today. He's pretty important here. Okay, so to understand how God fully loves, we have to understand that God, and then we understand the sacrifice and the life of Jesus in the middle, and then we understand love. And then we find someone, some, some people who are on the other side of this, that, that maybe there's a lot of love, but they, for them to understand God, they need to understand that what Jesus did. And for us to understand that, verse 11, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. See, it's not enough for us to just intellectually ascend here. And, and I've done it, and I do it a lot, and, and then I'll say, oh yeah, I love them, but then they make me mad, and like, I'm like, oh man, I really hate them. But then God's like, no, are you, are you serious? Um, you're supposed to love them. Um, and then verse 12, and this is where it gets really good, okay? And, and I want you to think of it in context of this little guy. No one has ever seen God. Okay, this, this is John who hung out um, with Jesus. So he's, he's seen God. Um, he's talking about God the Father. Just hang, hang in. Let's say. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. In, in the, and this brings us to Hebrew, some Hebrew. Y'all cool with Hebrew? Um, Hebrew words, um, not the book of Hebrews. In the Hebrew language, the word love is the word ahav, okay? You don't have to say it. But it's the word ahav. And, and the first place that we see it is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And it's in the context of God having called, and I mentioned at the beginning of the service, that God has called Abraham and he has appointed him and he has told Abraham through your lineage, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless your lineage. You guys are going to become a nation. It's going to end up becoming the nation of Israel. I'm going to bless you. And as we see all the prophecies, they come down through this lineage to the person um, and, and to the God of Jesus Christ who comes to take away the sins of the world, okay? That is where the whole thing is, is going. It's going, uh, if you want to go that way, if you look co- chronologically, it's going from we, we have um, God in the beginning having created, then he calls Abraham, and then he's going to build up this nation, and then eventually at the right time, as Scripture says, Jesus is going to come, God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. He's going to come, he's going he's to live, then he's going to take away the sins of the world. But a vital part of this is Abraham... And then his next kid. And the issue was, um, him and his wife are having issues having kids. And then finally they have a kid, and that's another story in itself. Um, and the guy's name is Isaac. Okay? You ever heard of Isaac before? It uh, means laughter. Um, 
his uh, mother was laughing when she found out um, Sarah when she was going to become pregnant because she didn't think it could happen. So they named the kid Laughter. How many of y'all would like to be called Laughter? Uh, so Laughter is there, and uh, God says, take Isaac, take Laughter, the son you love, the son you have, and sacrifice him with your burnt offerings. It's interesting that the first place we see the word love um, in the Bible is a foreshadowing of the full expression of God's love, isn't it? In Jesus, in the giving of a son. Well, this word ahav is not only translated love, but um, and as we look at, at biblical words, we have to understand that, that there are greater contexts and, and greater meanings. And sometimes to really understand a word, there's like a sentence that needs to be said. So for us to understand, fully understand the word ahav, it's not just love, because we, again, have all of our context issues with that. But the word ahav is also translated, and, and it's this general sense of you're breathing face to face with each other. And so as we, see, as we see this word love, and as we're trying to understand and wrap our minds around this, I want to ask the question, do you ever breathe face to face with God? And, and, and here's where John leaves us. He says that no one's ever seen God, but if we love each other, he lives in us. And the way we love each other is to face each other, to breathe in the same air, and to stay there no matter what. As we look in the New Testament, we see that uh, Jesus promises when he leaves that one greater than he, he is going to come. He calls him the, the Holy Spirit or the pneuma. That, that, that word means the wind. So I want to ask you this morning, where's the wind at? Where's the spirit at in your life? Is your concept of God this, this, this God who's off doing this God thing, who's making a list of your naughties and nices, um, who's only going to really truly love you like if, you know, if the conditions are right, um, only for a short amount of time, but ultimately he's, he's selfish? Because what Jesus did, he came to, to show us, he came to show us that the love of God is in us right now. Like the love of God isn't this idea, but it's what you do when you leave here and sit around the table with your family. The love of God is, is every breath you take without recognizing that it's a gift from God it is a blessing that you're missing. And maybe for some of us this morning, like, you know, if I was to ask you, do you have a relationship with God? And you're like, well, I don't really know because he's out there. Maybe this morning, for the first time, you're like, you know what? Maybe I realize his spirit's trying to get in here. And I'm not trying to get all corny and, and whatever with it. But maybe if you just let that deep breath out and allow him to come in. I don't know where you're at today. But maybe it's time that, uh, maybe it's time we put this, this understanding aside and open ourselves up to the love of God in here. Because that's always going to let us down. And we do have a God. We do have a Father. We do have one that is, that is separate from us, that is everlasting, that is, that is eternal, that knows everything. We do have a Father like that. But that Father showed us his great love in giving a son to die for us. And then the third person of the Trinity is the spirit that has been poured out. And look, as we go through Christmas time, we celebrate and we, we, we use like the church calendar and we say we're, waiting, we're, we're, uh, we're eagerly awaiting the gift. Look, the gift is here. The applause of heaven is happening right now. My encouragement for you is to, to join in. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, I thank you for bringing us together this morning. and um, God, I thank you for this season. Lord, it, it is it's so good to get together with family and friends. It is so good to, to get together with church family, Lord. But Lord, I, I know that, that it's so easy for us to base our, 
our understanding of you on being like a Santa Claus or an elf on the shelf, some, someone who just kind of enters our life for a little while and we get treated you know, good or bad based on how we are. But God, that's, that's, just, that's just an error. And Lord, I pray for, for there to be newness this morning for people and their understanding and relationship with you. God, I pray for those who, um, who feel like, you know what, I, I want to trust Jesus for the first time with my life and with my breath, with my thoughts, with my actions. God, I pray they would take the step this morning to accept you, Jesus. God, I pray for, for new life. God, I pray for us to have the ability to forgive ourselves for past mistakes because in Jesus Christ, you've forgiven us already. God, I pray for anxieties that we may have. God, I know that, that none of us are perfect. And especially as we come into this time of, the, uh, of Christmas, and, and some of us don't know exactly what the future is going to hold, God, it would be easy for us to just, to just put up a defense, to put up a wall and, and, and to, to keep people out. 